Welcome to Forward with NACI, Inspiring Entrepreneurial Action, a podcast that shares the stories of everyday entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial leaders, and the communities that support us. We hope that this diverse collection of stories brings you inspiration, inspires you to take action, and ignites entrepreneurship in your community as we make our way forward together. Welcome to the Forward with NACI podcast. We have a very special guest today coming to us from Paris, France. It's delightful for us to think about the opportunities this year is presenting to us and to hear about some exciting global initiatives. So it is my pleasure to welcome to our program, Rafaela Tretasso. Welcome, Rafaela. Let's begin by you sharing a little bit about who you are, and then we can dive into how we got connected and some of the things that we might be doing together uh, on a global scale. Thank you, Becky. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. I'm Rafael Trapasso, and I work at the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We are based in Paris, France, as you said, and we are what is left from the Marshall Plan uh, that uh, you know, helped Europe uh, uh, to rebirth after the World War II. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, organization is basically to connect uh, people and policies all over, all over the world to improve the quality uh, and the delivery of public policies to impact on the people's life in a better way. So our motto is better policies for better lives. Within this broad uh, platform that is the OECD, I deal with entrepreneurial skills and entrepreneurial education. We have a, a small unit that tries to help uh, uh, the public sectors connect with education institutions, with stakeholders, including businesses, to promote what we think is the thing that ignites uh, uh, you know, development, uh, uh, growth, uh, sustainability in our societies, that is uh, entrepreneurship. It's a spark uh, behind uh, economic development and sustainability. Uh, it's a relatively new field that we are developing. Uh, it's uh, you now has been around the work on entrepreneurship with uh, education at the higher uh, education level over the past decade and now we want to accelerate a little bit um, and we hope that you know these connections so over the Atlantic uh, in Asia uh, in uh, all over the world can create uh, a little bit of uh, momentum and in international community to advance on that. Right and Rafael as you were speaking I was thinking about what you said about that creative spark and NACI, which stands for the National Association for Community College Entrepreneurship, is 20 years old this year and in 2022. And one of the things um, that we do is really intentionally serve as this network that's connecting hundreds and hundreds of community colleges, universities, and uh, community organizations to really accelerate that growth. And I think what's interesting about the work that you're doing is that you're looking at it in a global context. And one of the things that you mentioned um, in your introductory remarks were entrepreneurial skills. So maybe you could share a little bit about what maybe a few of these entrepreneurial skills, uh, what they are, and how did you maybe experience those in your own, in your own career? Uh, thank you, Becky. The, the, the point about entrepreneurial skills is interesting because uh, we are, benefiting from a hype on uh, startups, uh, deep tech, uh, you know, all this uh, idea that someone creates uh, as an idea, an idea creates a business and becomes a billionaire. In reality, uh, our approach about on, on entrepreneurship, uh, on entrepreneurship is broader than that. We, we think about entrepreneurship like the capacity to be creative, to have uh, this attitude of problem solving, to be accountable, to be able to connect with others. In, in any, in more in general, the capacity to transform an idea into a sustainable product or service that is not delivered uh, through the creation of a business, but can be delivered within an existing business or 
in another organization you know, to advantage uh, society and community. So it's not only a business side. Uh, that's the reason why we think that entrepreneurship uh, is so important because the skills bundle that characterize an entrepreneurial mindset. That's right. That That's exactly right. And it sort of sets the context for success, whatever the challenge might be, whether it is world trade as, as you were doing, um, you know, and some of the things, but it could be solving social problems and, um, you know, even climate change, some of these daunting, just overwhelming problems that people have. I think you're, you're right. If we uh, work together as OECD does, I, you know, I understand that you, um, had 20 founding members and, and the United States being being one of them, probably one of the largest. Um, and I think about what you see as entrepreneurial mindset, what does success look like for you? I know that you are embarking on a new project. Uh, you had invited us to uh, help in some way, you know, collaborate on that. So um, might you speak a bit about that? Yeah, thank you. The, the, the point we are creating a, a network, so within the platform of the ACD, there will be a network that will be specialized on entrepreneurial uh, education and skills. And the name of the network is ECOL, so Entrepreneurship Education, Collaboration and Engagement. Uh, the idea is that ECOL can help, you know, to put higher education institutions like universities, colleges and other education entities at the center of a network that is diverse and connect them with businesses, policymakers, civil society. The, in this situation, the role of the OECD is that of lifting up a little bit the network. So, because we bring the international side and at the international side, you know, you are not negotiating with the, yeah, the minister or the secretary of state that you meet. You, you, you know, you engage in a communication that is different because you are not asking for money or for a policy uh, intervention. You want to understand what is the other person needing in thinking about the role of higher education institutions in society. The same thing about business, with businesses, of course. So a call should, be, should become this platform is incredibly difficult because it's very heterogeneous. So we need to proceed with baby steps. And these baby steps will be task and finish groups that will have something, a very specific task, so an objective, a deadline and an outcome. And we will be there facilitating the interaction and having, you know, as pen holders to take notes and, uh, you know, take advantage of the buzz and the cooperation of all the these uh, different uh, members. They will be also dealing with uh, global challenges like the SDGs, just to reconnect to your point. Right, so what I hear you saying is it's almost this network of networks. So when you were speaking, I was thinking about maybe the image of a hovercraft that hovers sort of above the ocean. And what you're doing is, is bringing together um, thought leaders and ideas, and it's very much, creating um, ideas and maybe a framework for policies that didn't exist before. And um, because it's sort of above a, a lot of the established uh, bureaucracies and things like that, it really allows it to be more creative and um, have more of an open playing field, which is, is truly, I think, where um, higher education um, and even K-12 education in the United States really needs to be is thinking less about ex established hierarchies and, and things like that, but thinking about um, what could be and, and some of those, those big um, initiatives that sometimes don't necessarily need money because you're using existing resources. Is that, is that how this is, is working? Is you're taking what um, sort of funded systems and organizations, if you will, and then bringing them together for uh, collaboration and conversation? Yes, in partly is that, in partly we want to solve very specific issues because, uh, um, you know, there are a lot of higher uh, education institutions in the world. Most regions uh, are home to higher education institutions. And uh, we live in uh, societies and economies that are really angry about innovation, you know, they need innovation. Uh, and so policymakers and stakeholders in general have turned to 
higher education institutions, and they want them to generate support for innovation in all regions. Uh, to do that, you know, there is a simple problem to solve that at the moment, academic research often does not meet the innovation needs and opportunities that are in the community because researchers are pushed to publish on international journals, you know, publica academic publications. So they mostly look at Harvard instead of looking at their uh, potential partners in, the, in their ecosystem. So we want to understand how to create this uh, a little bit of place responsiveness, we say, in higher education institutions, because we respect very much the fact that these are international uh, bodies or international networks. We don't want to, you know, to, to uh, localize too much them, no? to, 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 to bond them to, to a place. But we want to, them to be porous, no? to be ready to grab the uh, cooperation opportunities, to facilitate cooperation opportunities, and, and, and so on. Uh, what we, we call it is also the geography of higher education. Or higher education is typically a spatially blind policy. There is no space, no, it's not geography. We want to you know, put, put some glasses on that to recognize the, the different needs of the curriculum. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when you're mentioning and talking about universities, I know in the United States, you mentioned Harvard. Uh, NACI does some work with um, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has a number of different projects and initiatives. And what we have found through our work is that we occupy different spaces. You know, um, it, you know, there are organizations like NACI that are NGOs, so we're non-governmental organizations. We serve um, a purpose. We very much have to operate almost as a business, if you will, because we have to make sure that our funding is sustainable but we, op we can operate in a very nimble fashion. So we can get things up and going and off the ground very quickly. And it seems to me that um, some of what you're bringing to the table through OECD is really taking a look at sort of focusing in on strengths, um, trying to create some new policies and some new approaches for things. But tell us what some of the challenges are in your work because your you know your organization's been around for a long time um maybe speak a little bit about how you're organized and and how you overcome some of the challenges that inevitably you're you're going to run yeah. into. thank you Becky. this is a great question because the biggest challenge of our generation for people to work with public policies is that to overcome a sec the sectorial organization of governments mm -hmm. uh, it worked very comfortably to have education, innovation, health, you know. But then several challenges, including the one that we are living now, the pandemic, came along and destroyed the efficiency, the efficiency of these uh, siloed organizations. We need to work in platforms uh, across sectors of policies connecting innovation and health, regional development and education. It's not easy because uh, the institutions are still not designed to react to this need to connect both uh, across sectors and also in the multi-level governance, governance uh, system. So respecting the fact that policies are often implemented by regional and local actors, right? So, the, the biggest problem that we face with the call is exactly to operate at the crossroads between uh, or among higher education policy, regional development policy, and innovation policy, at least. Uh, how do we do that? We are discovering a little bit uh, ways to, to connect. And, uh, you know, uh, and this brings to me to a very important point, the way in which, the way in which I discovered NASI. Uh, or you know your organization uh, because uh, the idea of creating these entrepreneurial ecosystems uh, in which you can mobilize the actors also to generate complementarities and synergies among different policies because the actors are the users of different policies and so they can connect uh, uh, policies 
comes from a book that I uh, read with very much interest. That was your 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 book. Uh, that was I read I think a couple of years ago and uh, inspired me very much to this attempt to to you know to leverage on uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems, which in reality are the new cluster policy or the new regional development policy. You know, this idea of mobilization of, of, of society, of all individuals and all resources in a given place. Yeah, and it shows too, I think, the power of putting things out there in, into the world and, and that book, and thank you for reading it, thank you for mentioning it. Uh, the book is Community Colleges as Incubators of Innovation, and it really looks at what you're doing in your organization of how can higher education be the catalyst for change? Um, because really, if we're doing our jobs, we're not only just educating um, people of all ages, but we are really drivers of, of innovation. And it's interesting, we wrote that book, um, it took us a couple of years to publish it because we had so many different authors and perspectives, but it was pre-pandemic, right? So the world has changed so much. When I think about that book being published in the winter of 2019, I, I think who among us could have ever imagined that we would be at this point in time, two years into a pandemic where literally everything that we're doing, we're doing it differently, right? You know, but we have much greater access. Um, maybe you and I would not be having this conversation um, if the pandemic wouldn't have happened because maybe you wouldn't have reached out and. I would have been flying somewhere and you would have just let the book sit on the shelf. So I think the way that that uh, NACI and, and that my staff and, and my board are sort of looking at the pandemic is that people are experiencing this great fatigue, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And to some extent, there is greater opportunity because we have all perfected <laughs> the art of meeting via Zoom. We, we've um, kind of thought about um, really tapping into artificial intelligence, as we know that even in the United States, there's a challenge for workers. So I would love it as our time sort of winds down, maybe you could share a couple of reflections about what you've learned uh, during the pandemic. You're, you're in a different country, you're in France right now. Um, how has that shaped the work uh, that you're doing now and the work that you hope to do in the future? Thank you. Uh... Good question, in the sense that uh, this is a moment in which entrepreneurial spirits and mindset thrive uh, because of the, the problem-solving attitude and the capacity to deal with complexity. Unfortunately, not everyone has uh, such a mindset, uh, and so there are people that are very much affected by this situation. Um, the idea is probably that these situations show how important it is to acquire flexibility and resilience through entrepreneurial uh, attitudes. Uh, and so it gives uh, in further importance to, to that huh? because uh, it's not only about the education per se, but it's also about the social capital that being exposed to that kind of education can, can generate, you know, the, the networks, the mentors, uh, a, a different kind of uh, um, education system you know, that, uh, that generates new opportunities. Uh, what I see, you know, honestly, is, is something that it's difficult to predict. Uh, it's inevitably is an acceleration. As you said, there is uh, much more technology in, in our lives. Um, the key is not to uh, allow technology to uh, isolate ourselves from our uh, social part or social components and social attitudes. So that's the reason why it's, it's very important to uh, animate even more the ecosystems and the groups and the, and the local uh, communities to regenerate and to restart after this, uh, this, this pause that was imposed by, by COVID. Because of, of course, people like, like us can, that have this global, uh, international at least, uh, dimension are uh, always connected, always uh, in touch uh, with one another, but there are, again, local communities that are less exposed to international level 
and will need to regenerate their social uh, attitudes and uh, uh, habits huh? uh, after the, the pandemic uh, is, is finally over. And uh, it will be, again, uh, the, the role of entrepreneurs to regenerate, to help to restart, to recover, to, to, to build back better. It's probably build forward better in the sense that we need to look uh, uh, you know, forward. It is our humanity, right? It doesn't matter what country we're in. We may look different. We may speak different languages. But if you think about, and I think about successful entrepreneurs and people that are solving problems, right? They're developing customers and they're being successful in their work. They're really thinking about how it affects other people. And you're right. Um, people like you and like me are going to intentionally connect and we may get stuck, but we get ourselves unstuck. But I was thinking about an article that I read recently in The Economist magazine about the loneliness of, of people and, and of, of men in particular. Um, women at, at times, uh, and there's a growing number of uh, women entrepreneurs too, for a variety of different reasons, as we know. But I think it speaks to not only economic recovery, but the recovery of the human spirit. And I think what you're doing um, through your work, through the entrepreneurship, education, collaboration, and engagement, um, is really going to drive that forward. So maybe a great place to end on this conversation is um, please let our, our um, listeners around the world know if they want to learn more about your work, if um, they want to get involved um, with this um, entrepreneurship education collaboration engagement network that you're building, how might they do that? Is there a website? Um, it, how, can they, how can they plug in and find out more? They can... Uh, write to me an email. In this uh, globalized world, there is a possibility to access directly to people. Uh, I have a, a page on LinkedIn, which is another channel that it's easily accessible. And then, of course, there is the website where people can look for the geography of higher education. You know, a call, the, a call platform will be launched in the next month. And so, you know, we'll, we will include the geography of our education in that, in that website. For the time being, the geography of our education is uh, our uh, gateway. And then there are still books. Sometimes books can generate inter relationships, as in our case, maybe. Um, and there are the publications now that the OECD has done with a call with the geography of education, with HE Innovate, that is a, a project done with the European Commission. Uh, this is uh, our effort, as I was saying, to give visibility to the issue of entrepreneurship, education, and skills as a policy issue, uh, as a, something that policymakers can play with, not only to generate uh, better higher education policy or higher education outcomes, but also to influence other policy areas like regional development, sustainability, innovation. I think that sounds wonderful and I, I love it because it's, it's something positive, it's something new. And I, I'd love to invite you back in um, November of 2022, which is Global Entrepreneurship Week, to give us an update on the things that are happening. My hope is that NACI will provide value in supporting your work, that we can help plug other people in, whether they are in the United States or Canada or any of the 40 plus countries that listen to our podcast. So I want to thank you for your time, for your leadership, um, for your passion, right? Because you are passionate about the world, making the world a better place. And that's what we try to do here on Forward with NACI. So we wish everybody a wonderful day and keep tuning in. We appreciate um, having so many listeners around the world that want to join us in this important work. Thank you very much for the invitation, Becky. It was a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will continue to explore the many ways to define entrepreneurship with NACI as we celebrate opportunity, failing forward, and success learning from one another along the way. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform and follow at NACI on social media and learn more about us at NACI.com forward slash podcast. Stay tuned for a new episode each week. 
We look forward to making our way forward together with you. Have you heard about our latest book, Impact Ed, How Community College Entrepreneurship Creates Equity and Prosperity? This is our roadmap for building back better in 50 states and globally. In each chapter, we share the inspiring stories of everyday entrepreneurs and explain how community colleges play a crucial role in their success. Visit us at nacy.com forward slash impact ed to order your copy now and join us in this work. Are you curious about what's coming up next in the NACI community? Join us on the second Wednesday of every month at 12 p.m. Eastern to set yourself up to be productive and impactful with NACI by your side. We'll share about events, ways to get involved, and we'll have an open conversation featuring questions you're asking or problems you're facing. So join us on the second Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern for Up Next with NACI. More information at nacy.com slash up next.